name is Linda Davis. I'm the CEO of Next Generation in Davis Nolan. Uh, welcome to our leadership uh, series. We've done some in procurement and HR, so this is our first one in the CMO space, so thank you very much for attending. I'd like to thank our panellists for taking part. So I just want to give you the running order uh, for the day. Um, this event has been organised by our sort of, I suppose, scientific desk, which is Kate Kern, uh, Sarah McMullen, and also Jenny Hill. Um, so please feel free to make sure you meet them and get to know them and all that kind of good stuff. So the order for the day is, the three, our three panellists are going to get up and just do a sort of an eight to ten minute presentation on who they are, what they're doing, uh, particularly in the CMO space. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion of which we're going to cover five key questions. If you have any uh, questions you want to ask, please leave it to the end and we'll do a short Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over now uh, to Paul. Morning everybody, how are you? Um, Paul Condon, I head supply chain in Horizon Pharma here in Dublin. We're um, headquartered here, um, offices are uh, Connacht House, Burlington Road, so next door to the Mespel Hotel. Um, there, I'm there since August 15, so coming up in two years, right? Um, against the backdrop of a discussion on CMO management, going to spend just that five or ten minutes on kind of Horizon, just paint the picture a little bit as to what Horizon does because it is very focused on CMO activity. Horizon has a range of products, and I'll, and I'll go through the slides, but we don't have internal manufacturing, right? So all of our activity is through third-party manufacturers. So very germane to this morning's conversation. So um, just a little bit. These are corporate slides, and I'm not going to divulge too much that you won't be able to see um, uh, outside of um, media. Um, so very much um, a kind of a speciality pharmaceutical company. Um, because we're now more and more focusing on orphan drug and, and rare disease, very patient centric. And again, you know, we, we'll talk a little bit about that and the context of that and in CMO management. Um, focused on, I suppose, building a portfolio of products that, that targets both rare disease and, and orphan drug, but also, you know, the, the niche areas. So, you know, we, I'll talk a, a bit about the kind of therapeutic areas, but, but niche products, trying not to be too kind of commodity focused. Fairly fast growing, let me show you a slide on that, and growing um, certainly in more recent years by acquisition, okay? So just to put that in context. So now uh, we have 11 uh, different products and, and we're structured in business unit terms. So we've got three um, kind of commercial business units. The one on the left, as I said, kind of very strong focus now and kind of driving our growth and direction in the orphan space. So, so rare disease, orphan genetic diseases. Um, rheumatology is an area that we're, we're equally focused on and, and some of the, the newer products, certainly Christexa, is, is in that space. And then primary care, which is probably the genesis to a certain extent of, um, of Horizon, a um, bit more on the volume side um, in, in terms of the products. Just to run through this, and it, it might be kind of useful because again we're going to talk about CMO management, a range, so again, you know, <coughs> I hate the word virtual organization. Okay, so we don't we don't manufacture ourselves, but we have a thousand people, right? And I mean, they're not a thousand virtual people. They are very real people, and we use we use infrastructure to manage our, our CMO network, right? But as I said, we don't we don't manufacture ourselves. Looking down through the list um, again on the orphan side, and and this is just in the context of kind of platforms, manufacturing platforms. We've got sterile products, so Actimmune is, is a sterile fill finish product in, in, in vials, Bufanil tablets and powder, Revicti is, a, is an oral liquid product, uh, Precisbee is a sustained release capsule, kind of bead technology in a hard gelatin capsule, Quincere, another sterile product but administered through nebulizers, um, Crisexa is, a, is another sterile product filled in vials, uh, Rayos, sustained release tablet, Pensed is a topical solution. Uh, Duexis is a tablet, like a combination tablet, kind of a tablet core, in a core. Uh, Vimovo is a tablet, and Migrigot is a suppository. So a range of kind of platforms and activities, and therefore a network of about 38, 39 CMOs supporting these products, okay? So broad, broad kind of difference uh, of, of CMO uh, activity, okay? 
I mentioned that we grow by kind acquisition and we've been you know, pretty busy, um, I suppose, certainly in the last kind of couple of years. Horizon itself, not around terribly long, so I will forgive anybody that Horizon's name doesn't roll off their respective sons. Um, but kind of the genesis goes back to you know, 2010, so again, relatively early. And you know, two products, one in the States, one in a company called Nitec, which was acquired back in 2010, two come together, and that was kind of the, the early days of, of, um, of Horizon. Just moving across then, acquired in 2014, a company uh, from an Irish company called Vidara, um, and that was the catalyst for an inversion. So Horizon has probably 90% of its sales in the US was based out of Chicago, inverted, and now our global headquarters and about 60 people are, are here in Dublin and I head supply chain from here. Um, so Actimune, I mentioned, um, Pensed acquired. Um, so we, we, we either acquire small companies or products or assets, okay? So again, there's a combination on, on this slide. Um, Pensed was a product. Revicti and Bufanel was by way of acquisition of a company called Hyperion Therapeutics in, in California. Um, Christex and Migra got another company called Crealta, and then the most recent one, 2016, um, tail end of 2016, a company called Raptor Pharmaceuticals, again in California, um, where we have um, Prisisbe and Quincer. So that's the model. The slide I like is, is this one because it kind of tells the story. I mean, this just goes back to 2013, so $74 million in 2013, right? Which is only four years ago to 300 to 750 to last year was a billion, right? So pretty, you know, significant ramp. So kind of couple that with the previous slide that talks about the kind of the, the model, which is, as I said, product and, and company acquisition um, is growing rapidly. And, and you can see then on the right hand side, we're saying, you know, it'll be kind of 2 billion. So we'll double it in the next kind of few years, you know? So a lot of activity, a lot of focus on, and again, we'll touch on this obviously as we go through the questions and the, the panel discussion on CMO management, CMO integration, because again, these products and companies are coming with supply chains, right? So they're coming with preformed kind of ways of doing things and, and third party manufacturing. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that, you know? Um, kind of touched on this, so kind of from 2013, very focused on, on two products to a much more balanced portfolio of products. Now, broad therapeutic categories, um, but equally broad platforms, okay? Um, not just about acquiring and buying and buying and buying, but when we do get our hands on the products, doing some good stuff with them. So this slide just talks to a kind of a before and after. So when you think about um, and I know Noel is talking later, and th the first example happens to be um, AstraZeneca. But, you know, looking at products that are maybe not hugely areas of focus for other companies, and then, you know, we can kind of purchase them and maybe do something good with them, or focus on them, or, or drive, you know, a bit more kind of attention. So th the gray and the blue is the year before and the year after. So, you know, take the Vomovo example, you know, 20 billion of sales before we bought it, then the year after was 160. So hats off to the commercial organization who are obviously doing some good stuff when we do get them. So it's not just about ramp, ramp, ramp and, and, and acquire. But, but getting that balance and, and doing some good stuff. And you know, the, the two billion kind of target that I, that I referenced before is very much a combination of continuing to drive these products and then continuing to, to grow and acquire as, as, as we go forward. You know? So nice, nice, nice story. Um, what else? Uh, 1,000 people, offices, as I said, headquartered here, offices in um, just north of Chicago, Lake Forest, uh, in California. Um, we have offices in Switzerland, in Germany, and uh, commercial offices in, in Utrecht, uh, in Europe as well. So nice, nice growth model, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more as we go through the session. So that's the eight to ten minute yeah. quick intro. All right. Okay. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you very much for that generous round of applause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Folks, um, as, as introduced, my name is David Downey. Um, I have responsibility for commercial operations for a company called Almac, which I know a number of you may, may well know, may well work with. Um, I'm here to sort of provide the, hopefully the CMO angle today. Obviously, two well-known companies and a discussion about CMO, so it made sense to stick a CMO in between the two of them and hopefully give you that angle. 
Um, so I'll give you a couple of quick slides really just around Almac Group. Apologies to anybody that's maybe seen these slides before and knows the whole story, but I'll keep it very brief and we'll get into the Q&A and that's hopefully where the, the interesting stuff will start. So some key facts around the business. So operating for more than 50 years and um, working with more than 600 clients. So we started as a company in the late 60s by, uh, it was incorporated by a guy called Sir Alan McClay, who some of you may have had the, the opportunity and the pleasure to meet in the past. Um, Alan founded the company as a company called Galen, as a products company in 1969. Um, company went through a number of different iterations, a number of acquisitions. Um, built up a service business which then was spun out and became Almac in the, in the early 2000s. Um, for, a, I guess, a small part of the United Kingdom, small part of the island of Ireland, we now employ over 5,000 staff globally, so a significant enough operation um, as a CMO, but a very significant employer within Northern Ireland. Um, and it's something we really do seek to do. We don't see ourselves necessarily as a company first. We see ourselves as a, a sort of growing family, and that's how we <laughs> like to operate. Um, in terms of turnover, around about $750 million per year, and the last three years have been some of the strongest that we've ever seen. I think probably we'll get into that discussion today around outsourcing. It's a business that's only going to continue to grow. I think we'll obviously face various um, challenges going forward. Um, I'll get the B word out first of all this morning, Brexit. I'm sure that's something we'll touch on as we go through the day. But um, the expectation being that we'll, we'll, I think we'll continue to see outsourcing growing and growing. Um, as I said, globally headquartered in Northern Ireland, 12 locations worldwide. We operate in the UK, um, the US and also Singapore as well. This is just really a quick um, global graphic of, of, of where, we're, where we operate. Actually quite surprised me, I think when we look at, uh, at the, particularly the UK and Ireland operations now, we now have six sites um, in the UK and Ireland. Um, when I joined the drug product um, division of Almac 10 years ago, we had one geographical location. We now have four geographical locations. So it just gives you an idea of the scale and the growth of the company. It's a, it's a, it's a fast growing company. Um, the latest sort of addition to that has been the Singapore operations. We started um, clinical labeling packaging distribution out of Singapore about two years ago, and that's a, a growing part of our business. Um, obviously trying to look after um, that part of the sort of geographic area, particularly China, that's a market I think we will very soon be expanding into um, with a geographical footprint there as well. Um, in terms of the services that we offer, um, I guess one thing I would maybe say about Almac is its breadth of service is, is pretty significant. A good American term I think is soup to nuts. Um, so we, we start sort of very early phase within sort of discovery end of the business. So we uh, have a group, a diagnostics team that have uh, that discover biomarkers, develop those biomarkers, and then either license those biomarkers out to companies that are currently performing clinical trials, or actually provide that as a service. So they have a data a data assessment service that moves then up into API synthesis. So very early scale sort of benchtop API synthesis right up to commercialization of those molecules, feeding into a drug product development group. So standard formulation development. Um, and it's something that I'll, I'll maybe touch on at the, at, at the end of the slides where you can sort of bring these services together and integrate these services. Um, sitting between sort of the API and the drug product, obviously a big analytical services group in the Craigavon campus alone, I think at last count we had somewhere like 400 analytical chemists. So a large group of people there, obviously with the amount of API work, with the amount of formulation work we do, we have a lot of analytical support to that, whether it be analytical validation, method validation, method development, um, but a, a, a pretty significant amount of people supporting that. Um, clinical services, clinical technologies, this is probably historically what we were best known for. Um, so between ourselves, Sharp, and now, or between ourselves, um, Catalan, and maybe one or two others, uh, probably in the top three or four globally um, for the provision of clinical, um, clinical services. So labeling, packaging, a lot of distribution, and then also the clinical technologies wrapped into that. So IVRS, patient reporting, et cetera. Um, and then last but not least, the commercial services. Um, straight tool manufacture, which a lot of people, you know, you'll be aware of. We would, we would work with quite a number of the people in the room, but also more specialized services. Um, orphan drugs were already mentioned this morning. That's sort of a, a quite a big focus for us. 
um, particularly with US-based clients that don't have a European um, footprint. We can take their product from the US, we do the import testing, labeling, packaging, product release into market, QP release to market, um, and then distribution of those products out. So that's a growing part of our business as well. Um, so quite a wide range of services, um, and I think the value proposition, or one of the big value propositions for Almac, is how we knit those services together and how we integrate those services. You know, API feeding drug product, drug product going into clinic, clinic going into commercial, and it's how we sort of square that circle. Um, just for the last slide, I, I, I had a, 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 a small video clip that I'll, I'll play to you guys, but you'll start to hear, I think, probably a lot of the Almac BD guys talking about crossing car parks, not oceans. So the services that we have, and it'll, it'll illustrate it hopefully on the video, um, all those services are represented on our campus in Craigavon. Um, and you can then, obviously, you can start to see the connections where you can develop an API there, move it into formulation development, move it into the clinical, services move it back into commercial when it's commercialized. So quite a, quite a strong value proposition with that. So with that, if I can get this to work, I'll just click into this video clip. Okay. Bear with me. So this is a this was an older video clip we did a few years back just to sort of to, to illustrate how we move product from development into commercialization. So you'll see the actual campus itself is, are these collection of buildings. Um, just some introduction stuff around uh, the, the company that I've already touched on. But where we have the opportunity and the area bounded in red is the actual campus itself. Where we have the opportunity to, to start to work with clients from very early phase. So in their development phase and then move it up through the clinic and into commercialization. So you'll see this particular facility can offer services in non-GMP API manufacture. It then moves from that facility into the facility that will come up next, which is a GMP API plant, um, operating up to around about sort of um, 50 kilos of, of GMP API, which can then feed into this facility, which is a non-GMP for formulation development facility, so obviously you can start your early phase work there, your, uh, your uh, quality by design work, um, then moves across into the GMP pilot scale. Um, so within that, you're then moving up into sort of phase two, phase three, can service your clinical trial. That material then moves across into our clinical packaging distribution work, where it's packed up obviously to service the clinic supported by our uh, patient reporting team, so you can tack on your IVRS, your IXRS service to that, and then finally moving back into commercialization, so we have a large commercial facility there as well. And we have duplicates of these facilities around the world, but this, I think, provides just a nice illustration of the fact that you, know, you can come to the site up in Craigavon, you can choose what services you take, you can decide to integrate those services, um, and it sort of then talks to sort of then how we, how we manage those CMOs going forward and, and, and how we build value into those relationships. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, Noel Hassett from AstraZeneca Global External Sourcing. So I work as a supplier director within that organisation. Uh, firstly, my apologies to David for being over-enthusiastic and trying to take your space, David. Um, so what I want to do this morning is really give you maybe uh, an overview uh, and appreciation of AstraZeneca and particularly Global External Sourcing. So science is really at the core of what AstraZeneca does. It drives us and focuses us, and it gets, it gets that, that cascades down through the organization in terms of our processes and how we work. Um, our focus is on delivery, development, and commercial, commercialization of primary and specialty care prescription medicines. And that's across mainly three therapeutic areas, but we, also, we actually have a five in total, but it's mainly three therapeutic areas. And that's across about 100 countries, and we've got a population of uh, millions of patients that we, we uh, obviously supply to. So those main therapeutic areas are uh, respiratory inflammation and autoimmunity, CVMD and oncology. Uh, the, the other two, uh, infection and vaccines and neuroscience, again, they're smaller parts of the business and the vaccine side, we've actually divest, divested a lot of that business as of last year. Uh, in terms of the, the products then, um, across the, the main therapeutic areas, uh, they would be large and small molecule and uh, immunotherapies. The large molecule would mainly be through our metamune business. I mean, there is a distinct uh, biologics business in AstraZeneca it tends to run slightly separately, but it obviously it is part of the overall AstraZeneca business itself. 
Um, we've got a lot of key partnerships, obviously, with um, highly reputable uh, academic and, and biotech research companies as well, and that obviously feeds into our pipeline and what we do. In terms of the numbers for AstraZeneca, so last year we had a global or total revenue of about 23 billion, and that was fed by 21.3 billion in product sales and the 1.7 billion externalization revenue. That's as a result of divestments, uh, sales of some non-core assets and things like that. Um, the 23 billion comes at the back of a, probably a difficult period for us where we've had um, many declining uh, major brands. So as of about uh, 2014, 2015, we put in place a strategy where we wanted to build a platform for sustainable pipeline. We've put a lot of investment into that. So if you look at the 5.9 million that we invested last year, I mean, that really is feeding into that pipeline. We're, we're continuing to drive that. I think everyone can maybe revert back to 2014 and the advances of, of Pfizer and one of the reasons why we weren't taken over and why we essentially convinced our shareholders to stay with us was because of that pipeline. We believe it is one of the best in the business at the moment. Um, as a percentage of top line investment for R&D into uh, a percentage of top line revenue, we would, would be probably one of the top in the industry sector. I think that came out in Fierce Pharma last year, or sorry, last week. So um, as I said, we're putting our money where our mouth is in terms of our pipeline. And we believe we've got a very sustainable pipeline for the future. That 5.9 billion is, is managed by a team of about 9,000 employees in R&D across five countries. In terms of the products or our um, new molecular entities, it's about 120 projects in clinical development and 12 of those are in late stage development. Uh, we're seeing 11 of those approvals in 2016 and 29 since uh, 2014. And we, we've got an accelerator program, so we're seeing a lot of those NMEs come, come early, earlier than we would have thought, which is great. When we look at the employee count then, it's about 59,700, and that again is a story behind it, where we actually have uh, downsized our employees uh, as of last year. We've cut about 10% of sales and marketing and operations. Uh, we have uh, an, an internal um, initiative called Focus to Win. We are trying to obviously lean out the, the internal operations. We're trying to obviously feed that, that pipeline and that investment. So that really is the focus of all that lean work to drive that pipeline. So it, it has been a tough year for us. We've lost colleagues across all uh, areas of operations and, and, and sales and marketing. Nobody was on, 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 um, unimpacted by this. So it's been a tough year. But again, we're seeing the light. So we always touted that 2016, 2017 would be our, our return to growth years. And uh, we're seeing at the moment that probably by Q4 this year, we expect to be returning to growth. Uh, in terms of then manufacturing, so we've got about 30 plants across, uh, across 18 countries. Um, mainly, a lot of it would be actually internal packaging sites. That we, we, we tend to focus on that. We obviously have full finish capability and API capability, but a lot of what we do is in the, uh, the final pack as well. So then in terms of GES, global external sourcing, so this is it's quite a busy slide, but it really puts it on the page, what we do in global external sourcing. So it obviously it, it's, it operates as a virtual site, it operates our, our, um, our virtual plants and virtual uh, supply chains. And we operate across API and formulated and packed products. Uh, we've got two really distinct processes within, within GES. One is supply to customer, which is essentially current commercial products. And the second will be um, establishing new supply to, to, to customers, which would essentially be MPI. So they've got actually distinct governance models as well within GES. Um, in terms of numbers then, we manage in around 2,500 SKUs. I think the key distinction here is that those SKUs are mainly, as I said, in API and F&P. But once we extrapolate the, uh, the SKUs down to the market level, we take that internally. So the, the supply chain straddle internal and external operations with AstraZeneca. When it comes down to the market level, we want to hold control of those, those, those complex operations uh, and those SKUs when they extrapolate out. Um, in terms of percentages then, uh, we manage about 90% of AstraZeneca's API supply. Um, a previous uh, president of operations set that strategic direction where they wanted to outsource most of their API manufacturing. In terms of F&P, it's about 20%. Total value would be in um, around 1.2 billion this year we're going to spend purely on value of production. That's not including our um, operations costs. So it's about 1.2 billion what we're going to spend with, with, uh, with CMOs uh, this year. In terms of global footprint, then roughly 240 people globally. There's two of us in Dublin. The main headquarters for GS will be in Maxfield in the UK on the, uh, the large manufacturing site there. Um, again, we've been hit by the, the downsizing, so we lost about uh, 23 people last year. 
Um, we've gone through an evolution as well within GES. So I think like a lot of companies, when they, they set up their external sourcing hubs or, or, or operations, it was really about managing legacy operations where they probably wanted to free up more strategic internal uh, capacities and operations, uh, taking the products probably at the, 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 the tail end of their product life cycle and putting it into external operations. We've, we've evolved now into obviously taking in MPI products now where we obviously may not have the capability or capacities internally for new, uh, new entities, so we put them out to some of our, uh, our, our partners. Um, so then we've had a further uh, evolution then where we've looked at uh, business development taking on companies or, or essentially products that AstraZeneca acquires. Um, probably the latest would have been the, the BMS former diabetes business which I was a part of. I transitioned across from BMS to AstraZeneca. But as, as an organisation GS is active, actively going after uh, acquisitions and basically we, we, we sell our services to AstraZeneca at a high level to say, listen, we can take in those virtual operations, we can run them under our model. Um, and I think the final slide really is just to say that in terms of AstraZeneca's global operating strategy, we fit into that, okay? I mean, we're, we're about, as an organisation, as in AstraZeneca, delivering life-changing medicines to our patients across the globe or around the globe. But we do have a common operating model across external and inter internal operations. So, new product launch, excellence, science and technology excellence, Agile and flexible supply network and manufacturing excellence. These are the essentially the pillars to, to support the, the, the supply to our patients. <laughs> and these are obviously underpinned by SHE, quality and compliance, high performing organizational model and um, effective systems and tools. So uh, I hope that gives you a very quick and uh, nice oversight of AstraZeneca and global external sourcing. Good. Great, thank you. Thank you. Can you outline what the process is that you would sort of, I suppose, follow when selecting a CMO? And I appreciate we've got two different sides of the table, so I know you'll be coming from a different perspective. Uh, I'd look at this in two ways. So in terms of selection for, say, a particular product that we want to bring to commercialization, we'd look at it in terms of is the, the partner currently within our, our, our network or is it external? So if it's external, we'd look at uh, probably an RFI process request for, request for information where we say, OK, what can we do for us? We'd also go into probably an auditing process to look at uh, essentially their compliance, their alignment to our, our core values, uh, their financial health and stability, uh, their reputation as well, that's key to us. I think that would then essentially lead them into uh, an RFP process where we'd say to them, okay, you know, do you have the technical capability? Do you have the capacity? Do you have the pricing as well? So that, that's really, I think it's like a two-phase approach. If they're an existing internal uh, supplier, essentially just go straight to RFP, simple as. Okay. So again, the top three things would be technical ability, can they deliver on time, what does the project schedule look like, um, do they have the capacity based on the, the, the forecast models we'd have at the time, and again, is the price appropriate. Okay. I'm going to go over to you first before we hear the other side of the story. Yeah, no, no, I mean, so, you know, biologics, you're talking, you know, it's, it's, it's almost kind of um, focused on, on the quality and the security of the supply. I mean, there, there's a process around how we, um, how we identify and how we go through the structure, but because we depend on third-party <coughs> manufacturers, and you know, it's not as if they're a backup to our internal capability, they are our sole source of supply. So it is, it is absolute kind of security of supply, it is the quality, and, and I suppose equally, you know, the ease that we can deal with third parties. You know, I think in this industry, and you, know, you look around the room, I mean, it's very much relationship-based. Mm -hmm. So to be able to deal easily and comfortably with, with an organisation that is essentially an extension of what you do um, is, is extremely important. So, so the, there's this quality, there's security, there's supply, there's location obviously. Um, yeah, price and the RFP and, and that process comes into play as well. But with, with certainly with rare disease and patients depending on what we do, you need to make sure that you get the product. Yeah. Okay. Your perspective. How do you select or do you Deselect or reselect based oh, on criteria. That's, that's a dangerous question. Uh, okay. to select. Um, no, it, it's interesting to hear the, the comments of both both the guys because I think sort of it, it sort of rings true for a lot of what we do um, within within the sort of CMO space. So obviously the, the the bit that I wouldn't say we don't like, but the bit that is challenging for us oftentimes is the front end stuff. So the RFI stuff. You know, we can we can get an RFI in from, from Big Farm and it can be a 60 page RFI, it can take us four weeks to complete and you can complete it and then you come to the end of that process <coughs> and, there's no, and there's no business there. Mm -hmm. So you spent four weeks completing something that has delivered nothing into your, your, your sort of value chain. But I think to, to the other side of that, 
when companies come in and they've inherited products or they've acquired products and then they have the supply chain sitting behind that, I would always say, for me, the most important piece, if I can get somebody onto site in, in Almac, if I can get them to meet the people, see the facilities, it'll sell because the, the, the facilities and the people will sell will sell the business. So that's the bit I'm focused on. It's less the front end piece. We, we obviously go through that pain, but I would always be pushing for come to site, meet those people, form those relationships. And again, once we once we get you in, then it's just a case of then building and building upon that relationship. So that's sort of how, yeah. how we try okay. to approach it. And have you ever walked away for where you said like culture and everybody is particularly in the world of business now is talking about the you know the fight for fit in terms of the people you bring into your organization the people that you work with have you ever sort of stepped away and gone this culture just doesn't work for us we've got to find a different culture yeah to, to, to a certain extent culture uh, but but again you know and I, yeah, I keep going back to, to the products and, and yeah. the mix um, you know so in, in our case you know, those volumes may not be huge volumes right yeah. so you know there may be lots of third-party manufacturers out there that you know we are a customer of them right yeah. now those volumes may represent a small part or a reasonable part but if it's a small part then you're, you're kind of vying for capacity or attention or, or, or due regard. So, you know, there may not be that fit yeah. as opposed to, you know, the pure culture in a cultural sense. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, both sides might walk away, you know. Yeah. I see a moment say, look, sorry guys, you know, not, not, not our space. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've had to kind of, you know, yeah. go to plan B on, on one or two occasions. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I mean, it's, it's really a bit of risk assessment here. I mean. Culture may be one thing, but it's really looking at the organisation. See, I mean, are they a fit? I mean, we, we probably like Dave, so we go through quite an arduous process in terms of taking on new suppliers. It's important to us. I mean, taking it back to the risk. I mean, you're outsourcing your supply. You're not outsourcing your risk. So, from a regulatory standpoint, they look at who you're, who's in your external operations, okay. but you're responsible for them. Okay. So, I mean, they have to be the right fit. If they're not, I mean, yeah, we, we have to walk away. Okay. And how have sort of, I suppose, mergers, acquisitions, <coughs> divestments associated with both client organizations and CMOs influenced the way in which CMOs are managed? Like, what are the challenges that have arisen as a result of that? Um, I think I've seen it from both sides, being in BMS, been transitioned across to AstraZeneca. So first big challenge was putting across a new or different supply chain. Mm. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, it was a, it was a former, um, I guess, a virtual company operationally they probably wouldn't be as mature as we would have liked. The supply chain would have had too many nodes, inefficient. You're trying to, number one, pull that into a new, into an organisation operational model. That is difficulties and we're still seeing legacy issues as a result of that because in the industry we're in, you can't change that very easily. That's the first thing. So again, you're taking on more risk with that as well. So supply chain efficiency is one thing. Um, uh, I think um, engaging with as well, for an acquisition when you're, when you're pulling that operation across, engaging firsthand very, very quickly is important because you're, you're going to have an element of evaporation of people leaving the organisation. There's um, obviously uncertainty for some people. So um, that would be the second thing I'd say. Um, in terms then of divestments, that's an interesting one because I, I probably meant to say it in the slide earlier, Paul. I mean, Paul mentioned Venovo, um, where we were actually a CMO to Horizon for all intents and purposes. So that's actually changed the way we work in a certain way. We've divested our product. We said yeah. the marketing rights we'll give to Horizon. It's not really um, at the core of our strategic direction, but we said, listen, it is a, it is a good product, but we need someone else to, to market it, where we, we want to divert our marketing resources to something else. So essentially, we become a CMO there in that divestment. Okay. It's not like a, a straight cut divestment. It's gone. <coughs> we're actually uh, we're actually providing CMO services to another company. So that's where there's a, there's a chief difference in our operating model. And GES would actually do that as well. We're actually the CMO for, for uh, Horizon. Okay. I'll tell you later how good you are. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen the metrics. I won't do it. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I think, again, you know, we, we, our model is, is, is by products, by, by companies, and, and they come with, with third-party manufacturers. Um, I think the challenge is very much around the integration and, and working with those, with those companies. I mean, you know, each, each organization, each, each partner, has its own way of doing things, right? Its own quality management system, its own way of you know compiling you know annual reports and and and, and doing rake filings, and and you're trying to absorb and channel that into our way. And again, I go back to you know we're not a huge organisation, so you know our ability to kind of to you know to to mould 
the way we would like stuff done in a company the size of AstraZeneca, you know, yeah. um, would be more challenging. Now, so then it becomes, you know, how do you get that balance to, to respect, uh, and, you know, having worked in a large pharma and, and knowing how that works, you know, you, it's, it's not easy to, to turn that, that bigger organization. I'm not talking about AstraZeneca, <laughs> but, um, but, but it, it really is, it, it is about integration and, and working with people. And I go back to, to the people piece and, and the relationships and, and dealing with organizations because they are an extension of, of what you do. So it's, it's, it's absorbing and, and trying to respect their ways of doing things because that's their business. And, and I mean, you know, Dave can talk to that. Um, but equally, we have a portfolio of, of you know, life-saving, life-changing products that we control and own, uh, and therefore so how we deal with those CMOs is, is extremely important, you know? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I have to be careful with this one. It's, it's, it, <laughs> where it sort of touches upon us, obviously, you know, to, 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 to Paul's point, where you have companies that are, I wouldn't say serial acquirers, but they're, out, they're, they're picking up products, they're picking up companies. So you can be, as a CMO, <clears throat> and you may not believe this, but we do actually get very, very invested in some of these products. We do yeah, love yeah. to see these products coming onto the market. We put a lot of work and we put a lot of effort into you know, working with our client partners to get these products up. So there's a certain amount of sort of emotional investment there. And then you can find, a, a, on occasion, a, a company like Paul's or a company like Knowles stepping in, acquiring that product, and not so much taking it away, but the whole relationship can literally mm -hmm. change overnight. Um, so if you think about it, you know, you have an orphan, orphan drug company, an orphan drug company maybe has one, two products. In a lot of occasions it only has one product. That is everything to that, that, that company. They are trying to get that product onto the market as quickly as possible. So they're moving forward as fast as they can through all the various activities that you need to get, do to get that product onto market. The CMO is there assisting it. The company gets acquired by a large pharma company and everything stops because to transition that relationship into how a large pharma company works, that's a challenge, that's tough, that's not easy. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy for the acquirer, it's also not easy for the CMO. So there needs to just be, it's back to the relationship point, it needs to just be built upon how that relationship develops, trying to make sure at the end of the day that the product gets to market as quickly as possible and as safely as possible, but sort of managing and sort of tacking through that relationship as that relationship changes. I think, I think I have a final point on that because um, we, we talk about tech transfer, <coughs> we're transferring products from say one site to another, but we don't do the same for bringing in a new business because it, it, they're very similar. I mean, you've got one process that manages and operations in one company, one is a new company, and there's a gap there. But I don't see companies doing that. I think there, there, there is an opportunity for us to do it better, and like a tech transfer model, I think, would be appropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. And I suppose leading on from that, what factors then um, would lead you to establish that sort of governance model? And then how do you, I suppose, you know, how do you face any challenges, you know, with the CMOs in that governance piece? Mm. Because obviously if you're, you know, you're, you're acquiring them, you've yeah. got governance and you've got your own company governance and you've got the CMO governance. I mean, that's a pretty complicated relationship between yeah. all parties. Mm. It's, it's, it's pretty acute for us at the moment insofar as, again, you know, with, with the growth, right, and go back to that, and, and acquiring, you're, 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 you're dealing with companies who are, are, are all very different. So kind of back end of last year, we, we said, look, you know, it, it can't be all about, you know, the personalities involved and how we manage those relationships. So, so how I do it will be different to David, different to Noel. And, and you'd go to, you know, a meeting or a business review and the stuff you talk about is all different, you know. So, so certainly back, you know, we hired somebody back end of last year to start to put in process and governance and, and just structure. I mean, again, at the end of the day, the products are different, the platforms are different. But, but it can't be completely you know, um, varied in terms of, of sitting down with an organization. So, so you know, it's, 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 it's the basic stuff. It's, it's the performance, it's the metrics, it's, it's the quality. Um, what are those things that are, I suppose, important to you and to the provider in terms of how that business relationship will be developed? And it's, it's heavy touch and it's light touch depending on, on the relationship and, and the dependability factor on that partner. You know, so it might be very structured and we're visiting you know, a, a site or they're coming to us you know, religiously every three months, or it might be a little bit more ad hoc. So I think the key you know, when you talk about governance is fit for purpose, right? Absolutely fit for purpose, because you don't need bells and whistles on something that you potentially deal with you know, once a year or it's a, it's a 
dare I say, random purchase order once a year for something. But if you depend on, 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 a, on a biologic and it's a rare disease and, and you have a strong relationship, then it's, it's, it's process and governance. So get that balance. A bit of consistency, um, but fit for purpose, you know. Okay. Just going back to the question, so what, what factors uh, would lead to, to yeah. establish? I mean, th there's no question about you have to have governance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've got responsibilities and obligations uh, from a quality and regulatory standpoint, we have to manage our suppliers in an appropriate manner. So therefore, we have to have governance. Alluding to what Paul said as well, I mean, it depends on the supplier, depends on the supply chain, the level of governance. We normally categorise our, our uh, suppliers as strategic or non-strategic, and that really dictates the level of governance we put in there. And again, the, the activity and, and level of business as well. So again, it goes across to you know how you manage the relationship, quality, compliance, and the contractual side of things. It's it's kind of really for us before broad pockets, but the level of governance really is dependent on the the level of business and the supplier. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I would echo just a lot of what, what Paul has said. I, I agree with what he said. So the sort of the, the governance structure we tend to see, to my mind, the best way to, to build governance is from the bottom up. So you have the the classic pyramid where at the bottom you have the KPIs, the KPIs are driving everything upwards. So if the KPIs are performing then yeah. you know you determine how much governance you need. You know, if you have issues then obviously the governance becomes more important because the supplier isn't performing for you. So um, the, the, one of the challenges on the odd occasion we face is obviously as, as I said before you have an orphan drug company with one product. To them, that is the most important thing in their mm -hmm. portfolio. It's maybe only a product where the CMO is deriving half a million, a million pounds of, of, of revenue a year from it. So the, the requirement to put in a, a, a very formal structured governance for the CMO can be quite challenging because, you know, making that sort of investment against that return can be a bit of a tough balance. But um, where we would find governance structures particularly working for us at the minute is where we have big pharma clients who are working right across the group. And when we get the senior management and up to board level in Almax case, we have governance structures where our board is sitting at, at sort of at, 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 at governance meetings with the boards of, of, of some of the bigger players in the market. That gives us the opportunity to sort of get those guys thinking about other things that Almac could be doing for them. Mm -hmm. So it, it works for us as well. So it's a two-way process. It's not just a one-way process where where the the, the the pharma companies are sort of are, are driving their product. It, it, it can sort of work back into our business where it just sort of builds out that relationship. And <clears throat> again, back to the relationship thing, it's all about relationship. So the more relationships we can form at the at whatever levels within the business, just it, 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 it works for our business. Yeah. The, only, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd kind of just add, you know, listening to you, I mean, you know, when we talk about governance and structure and process and metrics, and it's, it's not all about control, right? I mean, this is very much about there is a relationship here that needs to be, I suppose, managed and worked on like any type of relationship, you know. So it, it sounds, even the word at times has this kind of connotation of big stick and control and, you know, yeah. You know, it's 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 us how to de deal and, and get better pricing with CMOs. It's it it there's a piece of that, but I mean that's that, that's a that's a very small piece. It's, it's very much about how how can these two organisations work well together, yeah. right? Because they are different organisations. And can I ask you, because you said you've brought somebody in to try and create some sort of standardisation yeah, process. Yeah, because, yeah. How, what have you found within that standardisation have been some of the biggest challenges? You know, uh, I know when you, anyone goes to standardise any process, it's sort of you go, oh, there's this or there's this, or is the diversity of the products creating major challenges in sort of creating governance or is it like is no, there commonalities? I, 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 I don't think so and it's it's as much you know it's as much standardization for us as, as it is for the, the for the CMOs yeah. right you know if it's it's the basic stuff that if we're if we're visiting Almac or any other third party that the kind of stuff that we're talking about is is somewhat consistent you know yeah. that it's there's a bit of a, a bit of structure to, to that and and just making sure it's it's little things you know are we meeting all Mac once a quarter yeah. or is it Jesus you know I'll ring David you know every two years because there's a problem you know it can't be that so it's it's not it's not the rocket science it, yeah. it really isn't but it's it's putting in place something that helps those two companies work better together and um, and yeah I mean sometimes there's a little bit of pushback but I mean yeah. you know 
that's where that's where I think it's better to spend more time talking yeah. to companies mm -hmm. than than, yeah. than not. You know. But the, the, the government, I mean, it's not just one side, I mean, it's about protecting both parties and ensuring both parties deliver. Yeah. So I mean, our governance process is just as much about ensuring that our internal yeah. operations team understand yeah. what their obligations were, how they enable the supplier to be successful. Yeah. It's as much about that. Uh, it's not so much about Big Pharma going in saying, this is how you're going to do things. It's about, as, as I said, you know, the relationship, mm -hmm. working yeah. together, putting in a model that works for everybody to make sure yeah. that everybody delivers. That's what it's about. But I suppose, as I say, as governance, I suppose, is working in practice, like how are you defining the goals? How are you defining sort of the various, how are you engaging those stakeholders as you're going through the process of the governance piece? Um, I mean, a lot of times it starts with the contractual negotiations, to be honest. I mean, we've, we've, we've got key metrics. I mean, they're pretty, pretty standard across the, the sector. I mean, it's on time and fall, it's level of deviations per batch. It's also on us, it's payment performance, PO performance, um, it's uh, volatility in, in, in forecast, those kind of things. <coughs> so they're, they're, they're pretty standard. I mean, the likes of David, if he got a, an RFP, I'd be amazed if there's anything, any kind of curveball metrics that are in there that you haven't seen before. Oh. Normally, they're, they're pretty standard. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would echo that because, again, I would imagine any of us in the room are, are interested in the same stuff. I mean, yeah. there shouldn't yeah. be yeah. curveballs, to, to Noel's point. But, but I the, mean, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on. The KPIs are for everybody. It's not just the, the yeah. client. It's it's about the the the, 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 uh, the supplier as well. It's protecting them. It's it's ensuring that they are enabled to deliver. That's what's key. Okay. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. No. And no. how is sort of I suppose consolidation uh, of the CMO market having an impact on you? Um, it's having an impact. Um, it's and it's positive and negative. I mean, you know, uh, you know, there's 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 a myriad of companies out there offering services, and 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 I suppose for us. Uh, you know, so you, you would probably aspire to try to partner with, you know, strategic companies, strategic yeah. partners, and, and build that relationship. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm a firm believer if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like, you know, so again, we inherit a lot of products and, and, and supply chains come with them. And, and if they're working and they're mature and they're, 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 they're operating, you know, appropriately, then that's fine. Um, with, with the platforms that I talked about, um, ranging from biologics and sterile fill finish to suppositories to topical solutions. There's not that many organizations that are doing everything, right? So there's going to be a portfolio of, of, of third parties. Um, the consolidation comes a little bit with leverage. So I suppose as we grow, we've got a little bit more, you know, in terms of, of, of offering, in terms of, you know, walking to an all and say, well, look, you know, since we were here last, we now have a requirement for, for X, right. uh, as, as an example. And, um, but, but equally, I mean, I think on the CMO space, there's a lot of, of consolidation there and there's, there's uh, you know, an emergence of a significant number of probably bigger players now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that works because it, I suppose it, it also helps build some of that structure because those, those third parties are familiar with you know, whether it's kind of key strategic account Deeper managers. Relationships. And, you know, they, you, you can suddenly talk to one person who represents two or three or four sites mm. of, of a CMO and, and, and that kind of helps as well, you know. Mm. And how are you finding it from your perspective? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd sort of, I, I play devil's advocate. <laughs> I play devil's advocate with it a wee bit because I, you know, I, there, there was a life before Almac and that life before Almac for me was big CMOs. Yeah. Um, when you get big CMOs that are essentially looking at their bottom line and trying to improve their bottom line and they improve their bottom line by going out and acquiring another big CMO and then they try and bring the two things together, build a value proposition around it and say come and, come and, give, our, come and give your business to us and here's the value proposition. Well, I'll be honest with you, those big CMOs are focused on trying to force those two organisations together. Oftentimes they're not focused on your product. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's the fit thing and, and the scale thing for me, you know, if, as Paul said, if it ain't broke, don't try and fix it. If you find a partner that you're happy with and you're comfortable with, with just keep giving them products until they demonstrate that you're no longer happy or comfortable with and then go looking somewhere else. But mm -hmm. going out to the, the, the big players, and we all know who the big players are, again, as I say, this sort of, this, this growth by acquisition, specific to the CMO marketplace, not, not to, not to the, 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 the companies like yourselves. I, I, just, I just question it. Those guys become, essentially, they become less so about 
getting products to market and more so about just filling capacity. That's all that it's about. All they want to do is maximize the capacity they have to them. So if you're a small or medium player, going to those guys, you can get lost in the noise very, very quickly. Yeah, it's actually very relevant for us because we've had a recent uh, situation where <coughs> we were actually, we, we were on a dual sourcing strategy. So we'd like to have a dual source across our, our suppliers. And we were in the middle of a, a dual sourcing project and next thing, that project owner bought the other plant of the same supplier. Oh. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that, that uh, didn't work out so well for you. So from, from, yeah. from a risk management point of view, it, it changes the risk profile. That's the first yeah. thing, OK? <laughs> uh, as Paul alluded to, it can create synergies. I mean, internally for us, it means I mean, we can have, say, for example, one supplier director or manager managing that relationship. That's great. Uh, but from our point of view, does it change the operating model within the plant? And if it, you know, in one of the cases here, we said to, to, to one facility, listen, we like the way you operate. We said to the new, to the new owner, don't change it. It works. Yeah. Leave mm -hmm. it the way it is yeah. because it works really well. Um, but obviously, from our point of view, we need to look at this and see, well, what are, the, what are their plans for the future? Are they going to consolidate operations into one facility? Again, that's a different risk profile. Mm. We've got to manage that. And again, we're obviously pushing them to say, don't change it because it will impact your business with us. Mm. We have to be forceful in that regard. Mm. Um, Obviously, it has an impact on capacity as well. I mean, we're probably numerous are seeing issues with capacities on, on varying platforms in, in the CMO sector. So consolidation is going to lead to that as well, where they may want to rationalize plant networks and, and close down facilities, maybe not. So um, it, it's a tight enough squeeze as it is in, in certain platforms. So it will have an impact on that. But really, it's, it's the risk profile that we look at and say, well, you know, what does this mean for us in terms of supply, short, medium, long term? And does it impact price? Because obviously I appreciate supply is the primary, but does it impact price? Because if they're consolidating, it obviously gives them a lot more power. Does that, have you noticed any price impact at all? Or? Well, not until you, you drop a new contract. That's when you know. Mm. Okay. So when we, we contractual term stays is that that's fine. It's when the contract earn, uh, ends, that's when you, you see the negotiating position. The other thing as well is that some of these guys, guys are trying to corner the market as well. So that yeah. will impact price. Mm. In right. this particular supplier, it's, it's in a certain niche market, and they are trying to buy up that, that supply. Okay, okay. So on to our final question and then we'll allow you to do some Q&A. Uh, trends and challenges as you, uh, have you seen emerge as a result of increased competition and capacity shortage? Um, yeah, I think, I think everybody's vying for the same capacity. I mean, you know, again, we, you know, and it's, it's very acute on the biologics side in particular. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's a consolidating landscape. Um, capacity is constrained. Um, the profile of a lot of the products that are now being developed, I mean, there's, there's a definite, you know, kind of shift to, to small, um, small markets, rare disease, orphan, um, and, and it's creating, a, you know, a constraint in just terms of, of biologic capacity, both in terms of, of, of drug substance and drug product. So I, I think the market shift in these kind of tailored niche products for, for, uh, for patients is um, is definitely driving um, uh, just a shortage of tightness, and and I mean I I mean I, I see it everywhere, and I mean you know it's funny I, I was at something there a couple of months back, and the IDA were talking about you know how do we kind of grow this even in Ireland? I mean look mm -hmm. at you know the the companies that are in the room, yeah. all faced with the same types of challenges, you know, mm -hmm. all to to David's point, you know, talking to the same half a dozen or less kind of normal go-to players mm -hmm. for for your your service. So Jesus, you know, I mean, and are you seeing any increase in the players on the supplier side? Is there any? Not of, really. I mean, you know, because because it, it takes, but I mean, you know, to bring on biologics capacity it takes so long, and I and yeah. I know I suppose I'm probably focused on that one at the moment, but it just takes so long, so you you are constrained, and um, you know, to, to kind of keep pace with with the with the growth is is challenging. So the more the more organisations can do, the more organisations like Allman can do, but equally the likes of the IDA and, and, and developing kind of clusters and talking to companies like us yeah. to say, look, what do you need? Where do you need it? Yeah. How can we help you develop it? You know, the stuff going on in Cork, the stuff going on here, you yeah. know, how can we how can we kind of grow that? To the benefit of everybody, so yeah. it's not just me and what I need or, or what yeah. Noel needs. It's, you know, how do we service the needs for, for everybody? You know, so yeah, it's um, there are some challenges. Yeah. yeah, big time. You know. Okay. I think I'd echo what Paul said. I mean, it's really tightness in capacity. Um, I mean, you made a point about new players in the market. I mean, it's it's very difficult to get a new player in there because, I mean, you know, for us, we need someone that's got a reputation, a track record. Okay. And I mean, unless it's a very niche platform or technology, we're not going to go with it. And I think if, if you're looking at a very small player, you're looking at actually investing in the company, to be honest, to drive them. Okay. And um, so really, it, it's more about consolidation is the trend. And, and 
I mean, if they consolidate, hopefully they will increase capacity. I mean, one, one of our parental suppliers, they're actively and consistently um, investing and in increasing capacity. And I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're at the end of their leash. They're really, really busy. You can see even in their internal operations, they're suffering. You know, so yeah. it, it really is a growing business. I mean, going back to, to what Paul said as well, I mean, it's all about tailored therapies now. They're smaller po populations. They're quite niche technologies. Therefore, I mean, we don't want to put the capex in, in internally yeah. unless there's a really, really big yeah, yeah. potential there, unless yeah. you're talking blockbuster. You're talking probably multiples of billions of revenue per yeah. year. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a tightening market, I think. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the guys raised some some really interesting points, and I'm I'm sort of trying to square it off in my own head. If you if you think about what's being said, so I think everybody's in agreement that capacity is currently tight. It is it is tight. As an example, and perhaps I shouldn't share this, but I will. As an example, our formulation development group for the last two years has been turning away every second opportunity that's presented to it because it can't get it into the capacity that it has, it has available for us. And what that then drives is expansion, which is good, but it takes a period of time for that expansion to kick in and start providing capacity back into the market. So if we take it from a premise that the capacity is currently squeezed. Um, we also take the, the point that, you know, companies are now looking at sort of tailored therapies, small volumes, so they're insourcing those um, particular products in, into their own supply chain when they can and for the example of you know AstraZeneca but what that then means is they've got to take capacity out of their internal operations and push that out into the market that capacity tends to be the legacy products so the legacy products then subsequently absorbs a lot of the capacity that's available so it becomes an ever decreasing circle where the capacity I think is going to keep getting tighter and tighter um, and what we do need to sort of see is is more people investing in the market in the CMO space, yeah. setting up companies. There's a there's a there's a huge opportunity in Southern Ireland for a good CMO to be set up. But it's 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 to Noel's point. You know, to set that up is going to take three to five years. To build a reputation is going to take a couple of years. So it's a sort of two way street. You guys as as pharmaceutical companies need that capacity. We as CMOs want to offer that capacity. It's a question of how we get that capacity onto the market and available to you guys as quickly as we can. You know, I, I think an underground impact of this, and we've seen it in a, in a, in a recent, um, currently project, but soon to be commercial product, where the supplier, I mean, they, they want to, I mean, they're in the business selling capability and capacity. Let's be honest about it, okay? But they want a certain, I guess, client profile per line or across their capacity. They'll probably work to eighty-five percent in terms of their, their total capacity and, and work, you know, <coughs> the buffering around the the, the fifteen percent. But they, they prefer to have stable, kind of small to medium volumes consistently across their operations. So when you come in with a big spike, I think what you're looking at there is multiple tech transfer products or projects within the same organization to boost up the capacity yeah. requirements as the, the product life cycle goes up. So that's what you're seeing. So you're going to be seeing additional costs to client organizations to fund those technology okay. transfer projects okay. and additional delays and supply chain uh, interferences and things like that. So it's, it, it really is a pain. For us, it's certainly be, it, it's, it's a crunch point. I mean, we had to go into a session last week to pull back a, a project by probably nine months. I mean, three days in a room saying, <coughs> how are you going to do this? How are we go going to work together to pull this back? Mm -hmm. Because we're ha we, we have the commercial guys screaming for this product mm -hmm. for launch. And it's one thing to launch, but if you can't sustain supply yeah. after launch, yeah. you're dead in the water. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So the net impact is on the ground more projects, more cost for the client. Okay. That's an issue. One, one more point I sort of Noel mentioned there, um, where we're certainly seeing more interest, and you can see it across the market, is capital projects. So the bigger operators don't want to start investing capital internally. Where we're seeing a, a lot of opportunity is now as partnerships and capital projects. So we would be, for example, developing a project, taking it up to commercialization, there's a, a specific technology or a specific requirement about that product. The client doesn't want to in, invest in that, and then the client then essentially co-invests with the CMO. That's an interesting model. You know, uh, uh, you look at examples like um, Hovio and Vertex. So Vertex, you know, wrote a check for Hovio to put a continuous processing rig on the east coast of the states. That's not an inexpensive um, investment. Similarly, with um, you know Lonza and Alexian, with Alexian investing with Lonza to build capacity in there, we have the same 
opportunities as well with a number of clients as well. So I think that's something you're going to see more of. You're going to see big pharma essentially writing yeah. checks to the CMO market to build capacity because they just they need it. You know? Does that make though the sort of I suppose the dynamic of the relationship because obviously that's a shift. Mm -hmm. So does that I mean that for me does that not confuse as to who who owns who's responsible accountability <laughs> lines? That's, that's where the contract contract comes into that's, place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and that's, it's like a JV for want of a better word. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Much, yeah. Uh, you know, but a lot of people would say JVs are you know. <clears throat> can be very precarious. We, we'll let the lawyers and the, the procurement people deal with it. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> okay, okay. That's their problem, not ours. Yeah, <laughs> we, fair we, enough. We'll okay. just administer the contract. But yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a big risk on both parties. Yeah. You know? I mean, you're, 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 you're possibly taking up a footprint that you could have exactly. used for a more yeah. profitable yeah. Uh, supplier yeah. or client. I mean, that's yeah. a big risk for the, for yeah. the supplier. Yeah. That's an like issue. most venture capitalists in Dublin would say, you know, just don't ever get into a JV. Whatever yeah. you do, never get into a JV. Mm. But, but I, th I you think know. the model is just changing. I think, I think you know, the needs of companies are just changing you know yeah. I mean look at the platforms that, that, that I talked about I mean you know will be very challenging for a company <coughs> to be able to do all of that in-house yeah. from from sterile yeah. to suppositories right so so you're going to so and if you know if, if a CMO won't fund it and you could understand why that mightn't be the case yeah. you've got to kind of you know cut it to, to, to yeah. meet the needs of both you know it's, yeah. it, it's just gonna say just to, to, to finish that point from my perspective it is though uh, how I see it is, a, is a, a sort of deepening of the relationship. You know, we, the old strategic relationship model is something that's been bandied about for years yeah, and years and years. Yeah. But it is genuinely moving away from just a tactical, we give you the PO, yeah. you fill the PO, we take yeah. the product. And a real depth, yeah. of, you know, if you're stepping into a 30 million euro deal to build a facility, you know, you, as, a as a guy said, it's a different, it's a different ball game. Yeah, yeah. The lawyers do get involved, but you know, if the relationships there, you can manage your way through that. Yeah, it, yeah. It's all relationship based. And David goes beyond; it goes into partnership territory. Then that's yeah, really what yeah. we, we we talk about partnerships, not relationships. So we we want to have a, a closer knit, smaller level of of uh, suppliers that you know are partners to us. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, I mean, remember why you know the CMO business is there is because the larger pharma companies want to divest funds into something else, R and D pipelines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. Yeah. So yeah. it's more efficient use of their capital. <coughs> um, so I mean, you know, there is a need there. That's the way that the the, 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 the industry is going. You know, unless you've got a really, really high performing key strategic product, you'll bring it internally because you want to control it. Yeah. And again, it may be volatility in certain areas of that, but it's really about efficient cash flow efficient use of capital and that's the reason why there is a sector in CMOs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to do a Q&A session if anyone has any uh, questions they'd like to ask. Or we can ask the questions. And then yeah, you can ask the questions. <laughs> <laughs> breakfast. Reverse it. Oh, there, 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 she's coming up now with the mic. <clears throat> yeah, right. Hi, um, this is pro it's probably for Paul. Uh, Philip Laval from Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Just a question. Um, from an FDA perspective, the division of um, responsibility between the NDA holder and the CMO, are you guys seeing any um, increased scrutiny or activity in that space, or ha has that changed? I don't know if it's changed, Philip. I mean, but I, I think Noel talked about it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's us, right? We, we are the license holder, whether it's an NDA, a BLA, or an MA here. Um, the accountability is, is on us. Now, we work very closely with the CMOs, and if the audit is going to happen, it's physically going to take place at, at a CMO activity. But, but I mean, when, when you talk about contracts and, and, and quality tech agreements and, and driving that, I, I'm, I'm not seeing an increased delineation, if, if I'm picking up the question, um, but, but you need to be really, really clear in terms of, of our accountability, because at the end of the day, it's, it's Horizon's name is on the box. Mm. Um, versus the services being offered by the CMO and, and making sure that there's no ambiguity uh, whatsoever in terms of, of accountabilities. Uh, we're the ones, I mean, it's our product, it's our reputation, it's our patients, and, um, and making sure that there's, you know, we're, we're, we're crystal clear. And that's, that's where, to a certain extent, the fine print kind of comes into play, you know? Thanks. Could I maybe just raise, it's, it's an interesting question, um, and I apologize, I'm not a QA person, um, but we got into a situation about six months ago, there was a change in legislation, I don't know where the legislation was being driven from, which license and authority, but we would QP release products into markets, into various global markets, as the contractor, as the CMO. Um, the legislation changed to force you to release the product against the local license. 
So if you were QP releasing that product into the Russian market, you were, you were releasing it against the Russian license. Unsurprisingly, the license in Russia is written in Russian. So how can the, the, the contract in QP, if they can't read Russian, confirm that they can actually release against that mm -hmm. license? So it, it do, you do need to be careful. It's exactly yeah. to that point. You know, you want to keep the lawyers out of quality and technical agreements, but by the same token, you don't want to expose yourself to risk by, you know, a legislation change that doesn't then feed back into a quality technical agreement. Mm. We've actually, we, we do all our, all our own QP release ourselves at Breeding House again to do it. But it's interesting at the point about the, the auditing because even aside from that, there seems to be a big focus on data integrity now in the audits. Yeah. That's where we're getting back from the CMOs, where we've seen a, an FDA auditor going to one site specifically just looking at data integrity for five days. Mm. Nothing else. Yeah. So that's where the big trend seems to be going in the audits itself. Mm. And again, and how the CMOs are obviously protecting data and obviously client data as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, somebody? Hi, uh, Jeremy Loftus from Mallincroft Pharmaceuticals. I work as a category manager, managing uh, CMOs, and just listening to the guys talking, we all seem to have the same issue regarding, you know, security supply. How how do you approach suppliers when you're trying to get to do a, a dual source stage and try and do uh, technology transfers? It is a tricky one because you know, you know, you 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 you're depending on these partners, right? Oh. Um, and and yet, from a product supply chain perspective and, and security of supply to, to Noel's point you're trying to kind of you know not have all the eggs in, in one basket now in, so, in some cases and again depending on the product and the technology you may say well look you'll, you'll buffer that risk with inventory right and, and you won't um, you won't bring on somebody else because the volume is probably just too small to, to split but if you go down the road of, of trying to do the um, a, a tech transfer so you've made the decision that you want two partners um, then you are you are, I won't say you're dependent, but I mean, but a critical partner in that process is is the uh, is is the contracting is the giving site, you know, from from where the, the product has been transferred. Um, I mean, I think for us uh, within Horizon, you're very much leveraging and making sure that we have in-house expertise uh, and that we understand our products. Now they're being manufactured as a third party. Um, but, but, but we own and control the tech transfer process and it's our expertise are, are, are driving the schedules, you know. But, but you can't get away from the fact, A, and it's funny because we're doing something at the moment and, and we're, we're almost trying not to tell the, the, the current incumbent that we're, we're bringing on somebody else. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's a challenge. So it's, it's all about, you know, walking that tightrope a little bit between um, not alienating um, somebody because you're still very dependent and want to continue to be dependent so you know to a certain extent you know you, you want to have that relationship that says look you know if you were us you know, what would you do you know we, we can't we can't depend on, on on any single source irrespective of how of how strong or robust they are and and you know work with them and say look you know we, we can split volumes we can do whatever um, but it's it's a bit of a balancing trick you know and, and you, you're back to leveraging relationships again you know. Any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Claire Salmon from Horizon Pharma. So, so this I won't. Is to you guys, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay for it later. <laughs> um, no, my question is in relation to um, serialization. So, because it's a hot topic at the moment, and I just, from a partnership, you know, um, concept. Um, just to get some thoughts on, um, you know, the service delivery and the capacity issues that are there with the, um, the skill set for serialization out in the market, and then from a cost perspective as well, because it's probably a hot topic at the moment for US readiness, but also for Europe. Paul, I think this goes back to a, a good number of years ago for us in Genzyme, because <laughs> we would have been involved in serialization project yeah. a long time ago and it's been it's been rolling and rolling in terms of serialization when it goes in <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a sore point uh, i mean like i like any of these things that are put upon us i mean it creates again capacity constraints in the market i mean there's only a couple of really big suppliers i mean uh systec are probably one of the bigger ones out there that everybody wants a piece of at the moment and mm. back in the day my their performance would have been quite shady as far as i was concerned i wasn't very happy with them but again they seem to have pretty good technology. So that's probably the first thing that everybody wants them. So how do you get that capacity? I mean, it's, it may turn into a bidding war sometimes. Um, 
we're also, I mean, luckily for me, I sit, sit within the, the marketing office of AstraZeneca in Dublin, so they're having the impact as well, where they're seeing that they have to put in systems in, in, the, pharma, in the, the, the pharmacies in place as well, so there's a cost implication there, so net impact is it's going to cost us more. And again, how do you distribute that cost? How do you uh, absorb that cost and who does it go to? Does it go to the client, to the customer, does it go internally? So those are probably the, the, the big issues there, but it seems we keep on rolling and rolling, which doesn't help things either, I mean, because it gets frustrating and people say, well, listen, put a dead point in and just get it in, that's it. It's, it's a big impact for us internally because we have a lot of capability and capacity in uh, finished pack and palletization and all that. So across our plants, it's, it's, it's a huge project. I can't remember the, the, the total cost, but it's massive. As I said, we like to take our final stage packaging internally. We like to control that and the final level SKUs. So it has a big cost implication and in the physical plant for us as well. Right from your perspective, Dave. Honestly, it's a bloody nightmare. <laughs> um, to pick up a sort of a point that Noel um, made there. So, you know, if you're AstraZeneca and you have a serialization solution, you're putting a serialization solution in place, you have one hardware supplier, you have one software supplier, and one number supplier. As a CMO, we're working with 35, 40 different commercial clients. You can be sure every single one of them has a different approach. Mm -hmm. So we're having to sit down, matrix it up, work out who's working with what. Um, usually number supplier, the hardware piece tends to be a bit easier to, to work out, but the, the, the number supplier piece is the difficult one. Work out which, which companies are working with which ones, and then um, schedule that from a perspective of, well, if we have eight companies working with this one provider, we start with that one, then we work, go to the next one, then we go to the next one. So it's, it, it's a real challenge. Um, my, my Personally, my expectation is the, the US one will get pushed out again. I think it will. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. But what I'm hearing from the market is there's so few people prepared for serialization yeah. in the US at the minute. And as soon as it gets to a point where patients aren't getting product, then the politicians will step in, then the thing may get, get yeah. pushed out slightly again. I don't think the industry is ready for it. I, don't th I, I know the industry is not ready for November of this year for the US. But if you take David's example, so from an operational point of view, it means disruptions to operations. You've got to put in the solution, you've got to validate it, you've got to debug it and all that. That takes a lot of time. That creates capacity shortages again. Yeah. And again, it's in frequency of that, it's more shutdowns. It all, you know, yeah. basically compresses things. Heaves the system. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Two there. Hey, good morning. My name is Sebastian Schuchmann. I was formerly Vice President of Commercial Supply Chain in Milan. My question is to you guys. Um, you talked a lot about relationship and partnership. Um, I have worked before I came to the pharmaceutical industry 10 years in fast-moving consumer goods. Um, and there, there's a close relation between um, the contract manufacturer or external supplier um, in terms of end-to-end -end visibility. Um, how much are you guys investing in end-to-end -end visibility, so having a planning system that gives well advanced notice to the suppliers? Because one topic that we talked here is capacity, and if you give well enhanced um, planning parameters, that could help, but also are you willing to share end-to-end -end information with the contract manufacturer? So given the fact like what are the safety stock levels or inventories in the markets and let the contract manufacturer decide when he needs to start produce the product? Okay. That's, a good, that's a good question. Um, from, from the CMO perspective, um, we're starting to see more and more clients that work with us from a commercial perspective asking us to integrate our SAP system with their SAP system to make it a completely sort of hands-off operation. Um, I think slowly but surely you're going to see um, this, the, the days where every month the forecast is updated and every month a set of purchase orders are issued. That's going to slowly move away and it's going to drop to the contractor to look at the SAP system of the client to determine what they need to do from a materials ordering perspective, from a manufacturer perspective, from a release perspective. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity there for maybe some of the, the software companies to get involved and maybe try and set up sort of bridging approaches between you know, an Oracle-based system and a, and, a, and, a, and a different Oracle, whatever it is, a SAP to SAP or a different mm. systems. So I, I think that's the way it's going. We're starting to see it now. 
it's not an easy thing to do because everybody's sensitive about their own data and their yeah. own information. Um, but I think that's the way it's moving. Yeah, I'm kind of on the fence on this one, to be honest. Um, I mean, we have looked at consignment stock options with, with uh, suppliers. Uh, not many have taken them up on it, but I mean, that mm. could be done to commercial terms as well. Um, I mean, our, our, our planning structure, we, we, it's kind of like a, a, a three-level um, approach. We've got a supply chain manager that looks at the overall supply chain end-to-end. -end. We've got asset planners that look at each of the, the essentially, the, the nodes or assets in terms of, you know, what the, the medium to long-term forecasts are for those, and then we've got the actual technical planners that do the day-to-day -day issuing of POs, ensure that there is you know, shipments on time, that kind of thing. So I mean, we, we do give good visibility. Normally on an annual basis, we give them maybe uh, 18 months to two, two and a half years outlook on what the forecasts are, obviously non-binding, uh, but at the same time, it gives them some oversight. And again, during the BR rounds, we give them an overview of the brand, how it's performing, what the likely trends are. That's as far as we go at the moment. Uh, as I said, we have looked at various supply and chain initiatives, but we haven't had the take up we would have liked. Yeah, just to, to close it out, I, I think I was I was probably with you all the way to the point where you said let the CMO decide when to make this. <laughs> yeah, and, and that just, just mentally was that, that yeah, extra that's jump. But I mean, in, in terms of, um, of of sharing information and open book, and you know, this is what we're selling, and this is how much you know we plan to invent, uh, hold in terms of inventory, and either you're our sole supplier or you're not. You know, um, you could see that the kind of the logical next step might be to say, well, look, you know. Um, I'm not there yet, to a bit like Noel's point, um, but 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 I think we're heading in that direction, you know, mm. um, to to varying extents, and um, so I think there's a little bit more to go, um, but certainly having the technology to be able to share that level of information and working with business units, and 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 again, but we're back to the partnership or the relationship, mm. and, and and owning that. Um, just facilitates better and better conversations and discussions. But there is a whole confidentiality piece around that. I know there is, is, there is, sensitive. yeah, you know, yeah. But, but we might still want to control it just another yeah. little bit, <laughs> yeah. For a while anyway, yeah. for a while anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah, the club of purely supply chain Milan. Uh, I have many questions to ask, but just to, maybe to limit it to just two. One is for Paul. Is there any strategic reason why Horizon has no internal manufacturing. As far as I understood, 100% of your source is from CMO. And the second question for all three guys is, uh, which are the main KPIs you utilize to measure your CMO performance? Uh, yeah, let me take the first one. So the, the, there's, not a, there's not a strategic reason. Um, and, and I think, so if you, if you remember the slide that, that just talked a little bit about the growth, right? I mean, so 74 million you know, what, 2013 to a billion, right? So that's been pretty, pretty aggressive, okay? Um, and, and the products we've acquired, yes, we have acquired them and, and they come with their own ways of, of doing things. I think it's a, it's a matter of time. So we haven't gone out and, and you know, th there's no internal conversation that says we're going to go out and build a plant, right? Because again, the platforms are also varied, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there, there are all sorts of different delivery mechanisms in, in delivering those. Um, Equally, and again, you know, I'll, I'll reference kind of past life, you know, you're probably only ever an acquisition away from something coming with a site, right? So, you know, if you look out the next five years in Horizon, could it have internal capability or capacity? I would say yes, but I, I think we're, we're not going to go out and either build it or buy it to service our current needs. I think it, we'll, we'll acquire something that comes with infrastructure to manufacture. Um, you know, I mean, we're 100% we're outsourced. Um, some companies are 100% insourced. There's probably something in the middle there that, yeah. that might be a better model. Um, it has worked for us and it's only as good as the, the partners that we're depending on, right? But, um, but it's not, you know, we have not said strategically we are never going to, you know, do stuff internally. Uh, I think something, <laughs> there, there will be a catalyst um, and, and something will probably come, you know. And on to the second question then. Yeah, what was KPIs. the second part? The KPIs. The main KPIs. Yeah. No, what are your main KPIs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll answer, I'll answer, then I'll tell you what ours are. I'll, I'll I just want one. to spread the fuzz here. <laughs> um, uh, I'll break down to three buckets, performance, risk and relationship. Okay, so performance is on time and full, in terms of delivery. Um, QA compliance, level of critical major deviations per batch, we measure that. Mm -hmm. um, probably cost performance as well. In terms of risk then, we would do 
third party financial risk assessments on an annual basis on our suppliers. We want to make sure they're solvent, there's no financial risk there. We don't want the situation where the supplier goes under and we're, we're left high and dry. Um, that they're adhering to the commercial framework as well. Um, their risk management approach as well, in terms of what risk are they carrying, that they actively manage that in terms of business continuity plans. We, we, manage, we, we, we assess that on an annual basis as well. Uh, safety, health and environmental as well, we, we look at that as well. Um, we also, on a periodic basis, we carry out audits uh, to ensure that they are aligned to our code of conduct, so ethical work practices. Um, as I said, safety, health, environmental, uh, data backup systems, business continuity. So every four years, roughly, we do that kind of audit as well. And actions from those audits are tracked, uh, hopefully, to closure. Uh, and the final one really is, uh, is a relationship. I mean, what's the hell of the relationship? You know, is it good, bad? Is it flexible? Are we working together? And that's on both parties, not, not just the, the supplier. Going back to uh, a central KPI, and this is really for us as a client, Payment performance, are we paying on time? Are we issuing POs on time? Forecast volatility as well. As I said, we have to enable them to perform and to supply us. And you know, we have to hold our sense accountable. So we do that in our business review meetings. We, we put it up there and say, well, how have we performed? So they're probably the main KPIs for us. Um, SQDCP, acronym. Um, safety, so the companies that we deal with are reputable, legit, safe organizations for their people, right? I mean, and it's something that we've been trying to, to drive. So safety, safety, SQ, Q, quality. So focus on quality, uh, conformance, you know, on time, um, we're kind of right first time metrics in terms of, of, of um, reliability of the product. Uh, delivery, the on time and full piece, and, and and all that goes with that. So you know whether it's it's delivery, it's it's how easy it is. There's there's a little bit of subjectivity to, to it as well, um, and and their ability to respond to our needs. Uh, the C is cost, so there is a cost piece. Now it's to me it's it's cost with a small C. Don't tell David that it's cost with a small C. <laughs> but I mean you know the, the, there's a piece there. But again you know it's it's much more around reliability and performance and quality when you're talking about rare disease and biologics. Okay. And and the P then is kind of people, um, and it gets a little bit back to the relationships, and actually having metrics, you know, you know, in terms of, you know, because you know, uh, you often hear the stories or see the stories where, where companies are dealing with third parties, not necessarily in our industry, but any industry, where you know something happens overseas, and and it's it's a it's a big deal, and there's there's a there's a people impact, and then it reflects back on the companies that they are dealing with. So it's it's our reputation that we're protecting by virtue of who we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a people piece there to make sure that, you know, dare I say that, you know, the, the partners that we're dealing with respect the people um, in, in the organizations. And, and there's, there's something there that, that doesn't impact kind of reputational or create reputational damage. So they're the five that we're, we're kind of, you know, focused on. And having those conversations in these governance forums, business reviews, and, and we're kind of rolling through this, and so you know, so show us your, you know, your your last time incidents at your mm. site. How safe is your site? You know, mm. and some of some of them are looking at us, so, you know, you know, that's our business, and we're saying, yeah. well, not really. Like, you know, we're, yeah. you know, we, we want to kind of create some of this, you know, because if it was our site, that's what we'd be talking about, yeah. you know, safety in our site. So there should be no expectation that we wouldn't want to talk about it when we go to a CMO. Yeah. Yeah. We any other questions, sir? We'll take two more questions, so yours and anyone else after that. It's actually a follow-on question to the measurement of you know, the KPIs and stuff. We spoke, uh, sorry, Joanne Fahey is my name. I'm currently working in supplier relationship management in Bank of Ireland, but I'm ex pharma, so, um, so we have different challenges <laughs> in the banking industry. But it's coming on to measure the question around the measurements, and you talk about people and quality and all those, but how is there any KPIs in place to actually measure the effectivity of the relationship part, so supplier relationship management and the benefits of that. So we can, the usual quality and you know cost and all like that, they're, I suppose, the easier KPIs to measure. But I'm just wondering, have you any thoughts on that? No, I, I think um, it's, it is a really good question. It's hard to measure. I, I think one, one particular situation I've come across is we've had a supplier that they've had an issue with, with a certain part of the process. And we've had lead times extended. We've had you know, close to stockouts. But what we said to him was, listen, we'll work with you, okay? We'll help you through the situation with the proviso that on a certain date, it's resolved and that's it. And that's like, it's like intellectual, you know, um, or sorry, um, 
how do I put it? It's like putting capital in the bank for later on, where you said to them, listen guys, we helped you out here. I think it's that flexibility is probably the main measure of a relationship. I think it's when you come to difficult times, you can't put a metric on these things. Mm -hmm. So it's really when you come to difficult times that both parties are working together. As I said, we'll, we've taken on a lot of stress and strain to help them out of this situation. We understand that, it's, it's a periodic issue, but at the same time we'll say, we'll help you through it, but it's got to end at a certain date. At the same time, if we come across similar situations in our supply chain, I mean, we'd like them to be able to help us. That's really the health of the relationship, I think. That's the key thing. But it's, you can't put a number on it, let's be honest about it. No, I'd echo that. I mean, it's, it's very subjective, you know. I'd love to know how a bank does it, by the way. You know, I mean, it, it is. We, we have, and I can't, I can't even remember what it is, but we have one of these kind of catch-all metrics in, in yeah. our scorecards that talks about the ease of doing business with this company. You know, yeah. it's, it's not about the, 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 the hard measurable stuff. Mm. It's, it's a subjective almost, you know, because you can't be, you know, green, 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 green and they're an impossible organization to deal with, right? So there's this kind of get out clause that says, look, you know, they might be doing everything, but they're a pain in the neck to deal with. And something that just tries to capture that, that at least forces a conversation or a discussion when you are sitting down with them, that it's not all kind of, you know, shiny and bright and green. Mm -hmm. And it's very much about personal relationships at the end. It is. I mean, yeah. it's really about two people getting on. Yeah. yeah. We but, survey, like we do surveys, you know, so to, uh, yeah. to measure the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ha ha have you got metrics for that? I mean, how, how do you measure? No, we don't. We don't okay. Like yeah, I know. It's, yeah. it's 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 yeah, a bit it's more. Very subjective. I, I would I, I would actually uh, just a suggestion. What I would suggest you spend more time trying to build the relationship and partnership and less time trying to metric it, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be amazed how simple things can yeah, actually no, work yeah. with suppliers. Yeah, yeah. I had a situation last week where a, a company had launched, we had helped this company launch its first product into the market. The guy came to site, he went to the project manager and he presented a, a small plaque to the project manager, said, look, thanks for all your help. That just, to, yeah, to, to, to Noel's point, putting capital in the bank, you can't, you can't quantify the amount of capital Agreed, something yeah. like that yeah. gives you, you know. Well, look, thank you very, very much. Um, feel free if you want to connect with any of the team. As I mentioned, there's Kate, there's Luke, there's Sarah, and there's Jenny. I'd like to thank uh, the three gentlemen here. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and please, by all accounts, give us any feedback as to what you liked, what you didn't like, what we could improve, or what we could change. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much for coming.